Welcome uh, to the um, schizophrenia and psychosis uh, family education support group. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, I, I do have some housekeeping items. Uh, I would like to encourage uh, family members that are here in the metro area or the HRM area, uh, if they have used uh, mental health services in the last year, uh, there are surveys, family surveys, that could be filled out. This really does, the survey really does help to inform and hopefully improve services, but we need family members to fill them out. They are at, you can get them at any of the clinics and you can mail them in or leave them. It is completely anonymous. Uh, there are also uh, surveys for uh, anyone who is in um, inpatient units or uh, outpatient services. So you can find them at any of the uh, clinics. Um, I'd also like to promote, we have the, the Schizophrenia Society of Canada's national conference is being uh, held here in Halifax at the World Trading Center. Uh, October 27th and 28th, the SSNS is hosting this event, and we have a lineup of some uh, great keynotes, uh, great legal panel, and uh, all kinds of uh, the, the short uh, workshops. So uh, please go in on our uh, website, www.ssns.ca. And take a take a look at what we have to offer. I think it'll be uh, a great uh, conference. So, without further ado, I'm I'm not quite sure how to introduce Lyndon Gray. She's a ball of fire. That's all I can say. And she's the founding uh, founding member of uh, Caldy Grange, which is the supportive housing project. Uh, she's undertaken, I think you probably started about four years ago yeah. when we talked about yeah. it. And um, she's just the driving force behind this, and I'm going to let her take over and tell, tell you where we come from and where we are now three years later. So come on over, Thank Lynn. You very much. Thank you very much. Am I okay to stand up, John, or no, position. you can stand. Just move the chair and stand there. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm sort of used thank to you. wandering too, but I'll try not to do that. I'll cover you. Just wander that way and not in front of the screen. Okay, is this better? Yeah, it's great. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Lindy Gray. Um, I should give you just a tiny bit of background. Um, my husband Ron Dolan is here with me tonight, um, and between the two of us, we have five children, one of whom lives with schizophrenia. Our um, our son uh, was diagnosed about, I'm going to say about 18 months after his first psychotic break. Um, as is often the case, doctors don't want to rush into a diagnosis. I know families who've never heard an official diagnosis for their adult child many years after living with the disease, um, not realizing that they could in fact ask their adult child's doctor for the diagnosis. Um, again, as long as their adult child gets permission for that diagnosis to be shared. So um, even those of us who live with um, a loved one who is struggling with a major mental illness like bipolar or schizophrenia, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what is and is not permitted, what can and can't happen around treatment, around becoming part of the treatment team, around what social services and cannot do to help support or provide uh, programming and services. And um, so it's been a long road. Um, our son is now 29, so he's lived with the illness for about nine years, going on 10. And every day I still think I learn a little something that I didn't know before. Um, often in the area of research around what exactly this illness is, because we're really still in pretty prehistoric phases of understanding treating this illness. Um, and I encourage you to look for an article called Rethinking Schizophrenia. Um, 
um, written by Tom Thomas. Gosh, I can't think of his name now. He was the former director of um, the um, National Institute for Mental Health. Tom Incel. 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 I N C L. Um, you can access his full um, article on a whole different view of this illness, um, and it, it you know kind of woke me up to thinking about it in different ways. And even very recently, I've heard another take on schizophrenia. Um, there was a breakthrough at, at Cam Beach in Toronto around regions of the brain, area 25, I think it's called, in which brain waves of people living with um, major mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia, have a brain wave activity pattern in that one area that differs from uh, people who do not live with these illnesses. And um, so they're looking at new treatments around trying to change that brain wave pattern. And he believes that schizophrenia is really a transmission issue. It's not so much a biochemical disorder. It's a transmission, a neurological transmission disorder. So that's yet another, another take on this illness that we really don't know very much about. I don't know what all of your experiences are with a loved one with an illness so catastrophic as this, but I think in the first few years, I walked around in a bit of a daze. I think I felt more like I'd been hit over the by a good solid two by four, um, I was. Um, I probably went through the stages of grieving, and the stage where you're in denial was a pretty long one for me. Um, this will get better soon. This will get better in a month or two, or at worst, in a year or two. Um, and we can all go back to life as it was before the illness. Um, I hung on to that for a ridiculously long time. Um, I think I'm better at accepting the new reality, but um, every once in a while you get a bit of a wake-up call around it. And once I got through the denial and the anger and the this and that, um, well, the anger phase was a really long one for me too. I railed at everybody. I couldn't understand why the doctors didn't know more. I couldn't understand why there wasn't more research. I couldn't understand why there was so much stigma. I was just mad all the time, and I think I was probably heading for a breakdown all of my own, and realized that I could blame everybody else for not doing better for my son, but it's kind of hard to do when you're not really doing anything very active yourself. Um, if I'm not doing anything to make the situation better, I can hardly complain that nobody else is doing anything to make this situation better, and of course there are many people working on making the situation better, not always effectively, but there are a lot of people trying, and I needed to do my part. Um, I think what worried my husband and I most of all is that we began to realize that this was probably going to be disabling for my son for a lifetime, that he would probably never be well enough to be a fully independent functioning adult, um, that there would always be a, a certain need for oversight support of some kind, and that if we kept our son at our home and cared for him in the way that we were doing, that we would create an individual who is less independent, less able to look after himself, um, less skilled, um, less connected to the community, less able to reach out for relationships. As we got older and less able to care for him, we were creating a situation in which our son was less able to cope without us. The thought of going into a nursing home not knowing what was going to happen to my son uh, was pretty horrible. And as I looked around the community to see what was out there for him, I was like, oh my gosh, there is nothing. <laughs> there is nothing. Mm, group homes, small options, well, there was a moratorium on those and a wait list that was already two years long and so apt, minimum two years long and apt to get longer a moratorium, which by the way, four years after saying there's a moratorium, there is still a moratorium. There are no new group homes opening up, no new placements opening up to people who really can't cope in the community on their own. Um, and so I thought, okay, what do we do? Well, we certainly did experiment with Tristan living independently um, in a, a bachelor apartment. We're trying to figure out how community service financial support was going to work for rental situation and our capacity to underwrite. Um, this wasn't adding up to a really good situation. 
Anyway, in the end, I realized that what we did not have to offer was a normalized living situation in a vibrant neighborhood, in a safe neighborhood, uh, where it's easy for individuals who don't get around well to access what they need in terms of their clinicians, the pharmacy, the library, the schools, mm -hmm. the shops, the movies, and all of those kinds of things, recreational programs. Um, those apartments were certainly beyond the financial needs of most individuals. And so I thought, what, what else is possible? What, what could happen if enough good people put their heads together. So in about 2012, I started doing some research. Um, so I won't go into all of what I discovered as I read on the internet and phoned people and visited places. Donna, maybe we can hit that button. I don't know where we are right here on the screen. Um, but push came to and in the end, what I decided was we needed to follow a model that had been successful in Montreal for over 20 years. I think we're approaching 25 now. What I realized was that although there's a range of ability and wellness, a range of cognitive ability and cognitive impairment that's quite broad and everybody's an individual, we needed something where there was a degree of protection for the vulnerable and people living with a major mental illness are very vulnerable. Many of them um, are, for example, very naive. Um, they are trusting in some cases, their ability to forecast outcomes of decisions they make today and how that will impact them down the road can be quite impaired. And so that makes them vulnerable to some poor choices or not choosing when they need to make a choice. We needed them to be somewhere safe, affordable, uplifting, you know, where you wake up in the morning and you look around and you say, what a great place to be, what a great neighborhood to live in. Um, that we needed to maintain their, recognize their ability to do many things, maintain a measure of dignity, and by all means, to enable them to be as independent as is possible for them to be. Because in so many ways, they're capable. Um, they don't need to be treated like children or infantilized in many aspects of their lives. Go again. Um, I'm not crazy about everybody following that we can all live together in one great big happy house. Um, I remember my dad when we were um, debating the merits of the nursing home in the latter years of his life, he said, I don't want to live in a building full of just old people. And I said, but dad, you are old. And he said, sure, but I don't necessarily want to live with everybody else being old and I can really appreciate that. And I think while some individuals may choose a housing option in which everyone in the building has a similar experience, may be a perfectly wonderful choice, but many individuals um, feel that there's too much of the institution feel to that, um, don't want to be centered out as, oh, you live in that building. Um, you want to just live in community like everybody else. Um, and so, uh, you know, I understand their need to just live in community um, where they can either gain some skills they're missing or practice ones that they are new to. Um, I know that my son has extreme difficulties with some very basic activities of daily living. Others are not so impaired that way. But um, his ability to pay bills in a timely manner, to um, self-care, to care for his living environment, um, to recognize that if he has a stereo up at mega decibels at two in the morning, there will be neighbors who, who would be consequenced by that. There's a lot of difficulties around that. And um, so in order to protect individuals from the consequences of, of um, their cognitive impairment or their skill lack, um, these are you know, often very high stakes consequences. You can get thrown out of your apartment, you can have your utilities cut off, you can have everybody around you angry and resentful of you. Um, and so if they're living in a supportive environment, um, there's backup there to help protect them from the 
consequences of messing up one or more of the skills that they need on a daily basis. We know many of these people don't comply well with medication and they need some external support to ensure that they do maintain a, a regimen of medication that's best for them. And of course, you know, what saddens me is how much potential my son had to contribute, and I think probably still will, but, um, you know, society loses hugely by preventing individuals from making contributions to society that they're capable of. And so many people living with major mental illness are so cut off from society that they are um, not, they are rendered unable to contribute. And that really hits self-confidence. Um, social isolation is a huge problem for many people living with mental illness. They're living in their parents' home. Um, food is provided, laundry is done, bills are paid, um, recreation is with mom and dad or sister or brother. Um, you know, there's a social connection to family, but there's social isolation either to a peer group or to um, community workers. Um, community activities, community resources. And so when you live in a quality apartment or a free apartment, we can guarantee that social isolation will be greatly reduced. It's amazing how many people are learning just by being connected to quality. So we do a lot of work for landlords, hours and hours of conferencing about who our people are, what we do with them, why it's a great idea for landlords to become involved with our organization, what mental illness really means for individuals. Well, they get to meet people with schizophrenia, and often many of them will say, I, I, it was so funny, it was so charming, I had no idea. I thought everybody with schizophrenia was X, Y, Z. So um, we, we connect with families, we help. Um, Provide support families so rarely get. Um, we talk to volunteers from all walks of life who've never had a connection with someone with a major mental illness who are volunteering to work with us. And oftentimes they involve students from local universities studying to be a care a person who's in social service in some form, occupational therapists, pharmacists, social workers, and their moms sometimes come or their dads. And uh, volunteer as well. At first, the moms say, Don't ever go into one of those apartments alone. And eventually, they say, How can I volunteer too? So we know we're educating the community and helping to reduce the stigma. Um, you know, I don't know how much you recognize how much wear and tear you're going through living with or having to support a loved one. But the Mental Health Commission of Canada sure knows they've done a study. Want, you can go to the Mental Health Commission website and look up national guidelines around supporting family caregivers. Uh, boy, they delivered as well as they spoke about this topic. Mm -hmm. We'd be able advocating for persons living with mental illness and con contributing to their recovery. We do about 90% of the work or more. And however, the unpredictable nature of many mental illnesses, their longevity, the historical barriers to family involvement with the mental health system, we have been shut out. Um, and although that's gradually getting a little better, you still have to have the sort of um, personality that I have where I'm standing on the psychiatrist's desk saying, you may not be able to talk to me, buddy, but I can talk to you. You need to listen to me. Because you practically have to have that personality to get through to the professional health care providers. And of course, they you know they, they have to live with the stigma that's still associated. And, and, and all of this can compromise the health of family caregivers themselves. And then they go on to say inadequate recognition and support, you know, all the burdens. And these situations create chronic stress for family caregivers that become collateral. So not only do we have a, a young adult with a serious illness, but we have burnt out families that are struggling to keep their own well-being kind of above rough water. So we're a nonprofit. 
Um, we are a non-governmental organization, pretty independent. We have an eight-member volunteer board of directors, John, of which is one. We currently have one part-time employee, although I was able to pay his last paycheck on Friday. Uh, one source of funding, and it's pretty limited, has dried up. Um, and the one that we were anticipating was seeing is on hold right now. So he's going to volunteer with us for a while. He's looking for other work. Um, we hope we can hang on to him because Matt is a pretty special young man in his late uh, 20s. And we have, at the current moment, we have eight volunteers who work with um, our residents. We have three apartments, two of three bedroom apartments. Um, one is a two bedroom. Seven residents were currently screening applicants and, and going through the fairly um, long process, you know, maybe a, a month to six week process of ensuring that we're a good fit for each other, the applicant and the organization. Um, we are awaiting filling one spot at Carlton and Spring Garden, um, and then um, three in the other in Chilean and then, and then St. Margaret. The St. Margaret's Bay Rotary Area Apartments of Chile. And all in all, all in Halifax right now, we had planned to be attempted an opening in Dartmouth, but in the end, all the residents far preferred to be in Halifax. They thought their best chances of employment were here. Um, they had family closer to this end of the HRM and so on. Um, yes, we'd like to be in Lower Sackville, Bedford. Yes, we'd like to be in Sackville. Yes, we'd like to be in Dartmouth. Yes, we'd like to help other organizations around Nova Scotia, but um, at the moment we have our hands pretty full, um, being as small and as um, minimally funded as we are, um, and you'll see why this is a big handful for us right now. So our coordinator, Matt, our occupational therapist, holds weekly house meetings in which all residents in the apartment um, must attend. It's a mandatory meeting. Um, and it's just to ensure that everyone's getting along and things are going well. Um, we, they, I know Matt has um, wrangled with the whose turn is it to buy the toilet paper, um, who left their dishes in the sink last night, why are you coming home late and you're noisy. Um, all of the regular roommate problems, of course, happen among people with major mental illness. Um, but it's surprising how little effort it takes to help them talk to each other, work out an arrangement that's mutually satisfactory. That sort of, do we have any issues we need to address, starts off the meeting, and it's usually over and done with within the first 10 minutes of meetings that can go from an hour to two hours long. Then they talk about goals. You know, we have this goal last week. We're going to walk three times a week. How are we doing with that? Um, cheering section. You know, all five days since I saw you last, awesome. Um, it might be um, you decided that since you lost your part-time job, you now want to be on income assistance, so you want some help with that, and I can help you with that. You'll set up an appointment to see you tomorrow, you'll plan out how that's going to go, and then you're going to make an appointment with your income worker together. Um, everything from employment to um, setting up meetings with I'm not sure how to set up meetings with to enrolling in our creation program. There's all kinds of things that are discussed at this at this meeting. Um, interesting how at first all the young men in their apartments went to their bedrooms, closed the door, and didn't come out for the first few weeks. And how now Oxford, our Oxford group, are friends. You know, they cook meals together and they walk together and they plan to do things together and they hang out in the living room together. Um, it took a while to come out of their shell, but they're gelling really well. Um, and Matt just helps facilitate that. Matt's also monitoring wellness. If somebody seems a little off, um, there might be a discussion privately with that individual after the house meeting's over. You know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What do you think is going on? Do you think you need to make an appointment with your psychiatrist or what they now on every three months? Maybe you need to go back once a month for a while. Um, do you need to see a family doctor when you know you don't have one? Okay, you better fix that. Um, 
Um, it's that kind of monitoring and discussion. Um, I'm telling you, Matt's been as busy. He does way more than the 15 hours to do right now. And of course, he feels more like a peer and less like a clinician to these young men because he's a 20 something year old himself. Worked in the shelter system, um, trained as a kinesthesiologist, then did his master's degree in OT, um, has been both a volunteer and an employee and turning points. He knows the mentally ill. He's worked with them part time ever since he was an undergrad. So, um, Guy to have on board. Uh, we spend a huge amount of time farming the just right apartment in the just right neighborhood at the just right price. And boy, screening and educating potential landlords, just any old landlord won't do. They have to get it. They have to get who we serve, what we do, and why it's a good idea, even from a financial point of view, for them to work with us. One landlord, a great guy brother is my dentist, said to me, why should I do this? I've tried helping you get this. I've tried having mentally ill people in my apartments, and it's a disaster. They leave within a year, and the place is trashed. They cause all kinds of problems for their neighbors. Why should I do this? And I said, well, that's the difference between the communities spitting that individual out to sink or swim on its own, and a community who wraps its arms around these people. We know that you need some support, that you can be a great tenant of support. And if you have a problem with anybody in one of your apartments that work with Colby, you call us as well. You can call the tenant, speak directly to the tenant, but you can call us and we'll make sure we correct whatever problem is going on. You get your rent paid directly from income assistance in many cases. You never have a bank check, you never have a late check. Um, doesn't get better than that for a landlord. And um, they get it. They do, they do get it. And of course, I discovered one of the senior members of the executive of this um, property management company has a brother, bipolar, seriously ill, older than her, living in her parents' basement. Parents have no support for this young man. And um, she said, Oh my God, if he hadn't agreed to this, I think I would have had to quit. <laughs> So um, this organization gets it, and they're fabulous landlords. In fact, all three of our landlords are separate, different organizations, great people. And we have to be sure that the people that join us want this for themselves. It's not enough for mom and dad to say, uh, time to fly the next bud. Um, and this organization is there to make sure you succeed, to do everything they can to make sure you succeed. That individual has to be willing to at least contemplate um, connecting with a volunteer who might take them out for a walk with their dog, or who might go to a movie with them, or who might help them get connected to uh, the visual arts community because they're painters and they want to get back in touch with their talent in painting. Um, they have to be willing to consider that as an option. They may not have done it before, they may be scared of doing it, but they have to be willing to have to be willing to follow the, and sign the Colby Grange Tenants Agreement, which is very separate from the landlord's piece. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, and so we make sure they really understand what they're getting into. And full disclosure, it takes several meetings, both with and without family members, um, before we're um, all on the same page, we feel comfortable that they're going to give their best effort to do their part, and that they're comfortable that we're going to give our best effort to do our part. Um, and of course, we work a lot with family members to ensure that they understand what this is about. Um, one of the things that I found um, challenging in this last year in particular is that some family members honestly believe that if their child says, you know what, I'm really not ready to leave, or I think I'll go out and get my own one bedroom now. And the family knows that this is unlikely to be a successful next step, it's too big a jump. Um, often don't have it in their hearts to dream up the grit to say, I can't stay home forever, because I'm not going to live forever. And therefore, we have to get started 
are you finding a way to independence or more independence now? You have three months to make a decision about whether you're joining Colby or whether you're going out on your own. But at the three month mark, it's going to be out the door somehow because you need to make the move. We've done all these things to get you ready, and all that's left is the push out of the nest. And that's really hard for families who've had somebody so ill living with them for so long. One dad said to me, I can't bear to, to, to have him out on the street or in the shelter. And I said, he's got Collie to walk into. Nobody's asking you to push him out on the street or in the shelter. But what if he doesn't choose them? Do you really think he's going to choose the street or the shelter? Than us? I don't know. I think you just have to stand firm. He needs to know that it's important and that you have confidence in him. You know, if you let him back in there saying she didn't even need to cancel, you give him the wrong, you don't really feel that, but you're giving that message out. When you say, sure, I'll look after you forever, you're saying, poor guy, I can't do it on your own, can't do it without me. And you just send a different message. So we talk a lot about how professional clinicians won't push, won't push won't say you must. They always say, here's your choice, you may, you may not. And often, I think, at least in my own son's case, he didn't have the cognitive capacity to make the right choice for him. He really didn't. Kind of like saying to a four-year-old, so time for your mumps or your measles shot, how about it? And the four-year-old says, I hate measles, are you sure? No, I'm not doing that. Well, any parent who would allow a four-year-old to make that decision, I don't think is parenting problem that sometimes you need to, despite your child's no, 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 I'm, I've been watching junior primary and primary students, no, 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 all the way down the walls of the classroom, bawling their eyes out, death grip on their mother's skirt. Um, and within five minutes of being cried off, the mom sent sadly to work with this baby, crying, crying, mommy. We send them a photo about 10 minutes later with a big smile as that child is playing with Lego with the kids next to him. You sometimes have to harden your heart um, and just find a way of standing firm and saying, I know this will be good for you. I feel it. I know you. I think I've got a good handle on this organization. It is time for you to take that first step. Probably is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some people aren't ready. Some people will never want this option. Some people say, Roommates, are you kidding me? Never again, I'm not doing it. Um, some people um, would be happy in an institution for the rest of their lives. I don't have to think about meals, I don't have to think about laundry. I don't know that there are a lot of people who would choose that, but there are some. Um, and some people really would choose to be home forever, if only they could, not realizing that you won't be there as long as they will be. Um, and so, it's not for everyone. There are lots of models. There just aren't a lot here in Halifax. There aren't a lot of choices anywhere in Canada, but Halifax is particularly deprived. London, Ontario is doing a great job. CMHA down there does a lot of housing work. Our CMHA is more into programs for um, you know, uh, 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 skill development and recreation and that kind of thing. They're not into housing and care for it. Um, we talk to families about desirable prereqs. Um, somebody who's actively denying the need for medications or who really want to try it without medication um, but has not been successful in the past in maintaining wellness without it. You know, it's going to be tough. I actually, we had an individual come through a fair few stages of process of considering them for tenancy and calling parking. And when I went back over the tenancy agreement with them, the call the tenancy agreement, the first step of that agreement is to agree to maintain your medic, like to stay on your medication as prescribed, unless and until you've negotiated a change with your physician. Like you don't do you don't decide for yourself, I'll try it on a half dosage this month or I'll double the dosage this month because I'm not getting the desired effect. Got to do that in collaboration with the physician. That's the number one rule. And when I went through this, I think it was probably Matt had gone through it twice and I went through it once with him. And he said, I should probably admit to you that I haven't been on medications for like about seven or eight weeks. And 
Or <laughs> you didn't mention this the last few times we talked about this. Yeah, I'm feeling a little guilty that I didn't speak up. I mean, you didn't ask me flat out if I was still on my medication, but neither did, of course, he offer it up. And he said, No, no, I really don't feel I need it. I said, Oh, so your doctor's good with that. Like, you're, you've all agreed that this would be a worthwhile exercise. I'm not sure. I don't think about it. I only see her about once every three months. No, I'm only. No, I said, Well, you're going to have to go and make an appointment to see her, and if she can write me a little note that says the two of you are on the same page around medication, everything's good, and you know, you're know you doing this experiment in collaboration with your doctor, we're good. But without that, it automatically makes you um, unable to join us just yet. Um, we also went on to talk about other things with this candidate, like goals. Um, and we talked about being willing to accept some support to learn new skills. And you said, well, new skills like what? And I said, well, mom, maybe, you know, you know this young man better than anybody else in the world, I'm sure. But what would you say would be a good skill for your son to work on as a quality resident? And she said, grocery shopping. And I said, oh. Um, now, he had recently moved from his mom's apartment to a small bachelor, almost like a room income situation. And I said, but haven't you been living on your own for a few months? Yeah. Well, well how do you do your grocery shopping? Mom does it for me. She drops the groceries off. Right? And I'm like, oh, dear, that's going to have to stop because you have to learn how to do your own grocery shopping. And he turned to his mother and he said, you never taught me how to do that. Really quite angry. I said, well, give your mom a break. There's really no grocery shopping 101. Like, pretty much everybody just hangs out with mom or dad and goes grocery shopping a few times, and then eventually they give it a try on their own. There's no real course that learned a series of lessons. I'm very nervous about being in busy, busy grocery stores. I said, I get that. Kind of bugs me, too. Don't like long lineups. But Sobeys is open 24-7. So you can go at 6 o'clock in the morning and roll a bowling down, fall down the grocery aisle, and you wouldn't get anybody. Good time to grocery shop. Like, we'll help you with little ways around some of the difficulties. Um, anyway, long story short, he phoned that the next day and said he didn't think Aldi was a good fit for him. Not ready to take responsibility for independence. Not ready to accept that some form of medication is likely to be necessary for at least the immediate future. And so um, he may come back a year or two or five, we don't know. But that's why we go through this process, because we don't want um, to make that spot in a common apartment unavailable to somebody ready for the support if he's being occupied by somebody who can't grow in that situation easily. So we work on that. Um, not everybody, as I said, is suited to shared living, and so that's something you really want to think about, because you're sharing common space. You have your own private bedroom, but you have to share Living room. Um, and we want to help them form good relationships. They may not have all or even some of the skills necessary at the beginning, but they need to want to connect to others. And most of the young men aren't met very keen on them. One of our most recent college residents said, My number one goal is socialization. <laughs> so we can help with that. And they need to participate fully in the COVID community. We've encouraged um, some of our residents to join the Bloom program. I don't know if we're familiar with the Bloom Pharmacy mm -hmm. program. Um, you know, we help them um, develop better relationships with their outreach worker at their um, clinic. We help them make better connections to their social worker and assistants. Uh, we help to connect them to the library or the, you know, whatever, the various and sundry people and places introduce them to um, the York Redoubt, some of them have lived here all their lives and they wouldn't be able to get away. Grab a dog, grab a few people from Aldi, head out to York Redoubt, and have plenty of opportunities to here. So just get them out and about. And if they're not willing to do that, then this is probably not the place for them. So there are about 10 items on the call tenant agreement. Um, to help ensure that they understand that, for example, their buddy from um, hospital cannot come and camp out in the living room. Um, it's just against the quality tenants agreement because it's disrespectful.
respectful of the other roommates in the house. Um, now, if they have a friend who wants to stay for a night or two, they're visiting the city, for example, or um, they just want to have an overnight with a friend, that can be arranged. They need to talk to their roommates, and make sure their roommates are okay with that. They need to talk to the OT and inform him that that's the decision being made, and that's fine, but what we don't want is Sister Maria, who has an addiction problem, sleeping on the sofa for 10 weeks. Um, and so we want to be up front with tenants about when you're sharing, it's not the same as having your own place. You've got to be considerate of your other, other members. So any of you would like to see that tenant agreement, can certainly send you a copy of it or um, show you. I've got it sitting on my laptop. I meant to print out a couple of copies and I forgot to do that. But um, it covers all kinds of just what others might consider common sense, but may not be front and center in the mind of I don't know what you want to know about um, who pays the rent, how does income assistance play a part? Do you want to know more about the model that's been operating in Montreal for a quarter of a century? Um, do you know our challenges around funding? Uh, do you know who refers to us? Do you want to know more about that? Asking those uh, some questions. From either people online or people in the room, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'll start with a question. Sure. There's obviously a lot of work that goes into identifying who is a suitable person um, for quality. Yeah. Even so, sometimes things don't work out. Have you had sure. that situation? Yeah, yeah we have. Um, so there was an occasion, for example, when a uh, psychiatric nurse from um, um, yeah, from one of the, you know, one of the clinics, not, not from critical care, but from one of the clinics, the outpatient offices, who um, hoped and recommended that one young man join us. And um, it was a little before we became a completely independent organization. We were affiliated with another for a while, and she worked with that other organization. And um, so when we started to provide support in this apartment, what we discovered was that this young man was not taking medication as prescribed. Um, this was, I mean, we learned a lot from the very beginning of our startup of this organization, but it was before we had um, a comprehensive tenants agreement. So what we discovered that was that he was not taking his medication, not because he didn't want to, but he couldn't put the money together. He was working as a fast food chef in a bar in Dartmouth. And um, so he uh, often didn't find he had the finances to go and pay for his medication. And his medication was coming through the IWK because that um, dispensary is the least expensive dispensary in the HRM. And he didn't want to cross the bridge, he didn't like the bridge, he hated coming over the Halifax side. So between the money and the travel, he wasn't taking his meds. And he clearly needed them and was even willing to take them just there were silly barriers to him taking his medication. Also, he was still consuming marijuana at fairly high levels. And while he kept this hidden from the clinician who he referred, um, we were all unaware until he started living in the apartment. And despite our best efforts to convince him that this was not a choice that was going to lead to better things for him, um, he was flatly unwilling to change that practice. And was being honest with us about it. Um, and so we helped uh, him find another living arrangement and moved to another quality. He wasn't a good roommate for the other two people in that apartment just by virtue of smoking marijuana in the apartment. That alone would make him an unsuitable roommate. Um, so yeah, we've had, an, uh, we've had other cases where um, adult child said, mm, you know, all the work that Baldi is to me, I don't really want to do it anymore when I come home. So, but the work involved really not a lot of pressure to perform. It was just um, whenever a recreational activity was suggested, he was never interested. He stayed at his mom's house five days out of seven. Um, he kept canceling appointments to either meet a boom pharmacist or go to a recreational event or meet up with person who's going to help him cook the shared meal that night, he was a no-show. And um, and mom was happy to have him back home because he wasn't ready 
to do the things that would help him develop more skill and independence. Um, and so, fair enough. I mean, if you decided that this is more than you were willing to undertake, you thought you could or would, and then you decide you didn't, and it's not a jail, we don't want to keep people there. And so, well, so generally, what we do is we say responsible for your rent until we can um, find a suitable replacement, and then you're free to return to your other living. Um, that's how that works. Um, so we've had two instances where it didn't work out very well for family and individual. Now. How does funding work with income assistance? Well, really well for the most part. I've had a really good relationship with um, the Department of Community Services and Income Assistance. I think it took, though, me attending a mental health meaning. So all the people that work with people who are struggling with a major mental illness who get into difficulty with the law, and they had a meeting with the judge, the mental health court judge, and many of the senior people in the Department of Health, Community Services, and so on, and they wanted to ask me about this model and how that might help keep people out of the, out of the criminal court system. Um, and uh, one of the things I said to the woman who came from Department of Community Services, one, this was early on, before we opened our first department, and I said, I'm told that if you share an apartment, you can't get the entire 535 a month allowance for rent and utilities. Oh, no, 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 she said. Um, you bring the, the roommate, the lease, the two signatures on the lease, and we will you know, 50% of the apartment. So if the apartment is a two-bedroom at $900 a month, we will pay $450 a month for this tenant and $450 a month for this tenant and send it directly to the landlord so it never gets their bank account. So we can assure ourselves that the rent of this is always paid. I said, great, but what about utilities? Very few landlords include utilities. And I've been told that unless you're renting something that includes utilities, you can't claim utilities. Oh, no, 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 she said, that's wrong. Yes, indeed, we'll pay utilities up to the maximum of 535. So if your share of the $900 is 450, then you can get the difference between 535 and 450 toward utility bills. I said, great, because that's absolutely 100% opposite to what one of your employees, a social worker who administers in terms of systems, that is exactly opposite to what I was told by that employee. Oh dear, she said, have some correct information. Looking at me as though, are you sure that's what I said? <laughs> yep, I'm sure. So we wrangle that. Now, it's not an easy ride, let me tell you, because first of all, there's damage deposit, right? Well, income assistance will provide damage deposit once. And if it isn't returned to them, they'll never give it back out the second time. Well, many of the people that we meet long since have spent their initial damage deposit and it never came back because the apartment was left in a total shambles. Um, and so where do we get the damage deposit money from? We won't get it from income assistance. So that could be an issue. Um, some landlords will forego it under the circumstances. Um, but income assistance, it takes them time. They need a signed lease. They need a blue form talking about, you know, all your details, who you are, and what your previous tenancy history was, and all that. That has to come along with the signed lease. Well, landlords won't sign a lease without, you know, the rent being prearranged to arrive, the damage deposit, the paid proof of tenant insurance, property insurance. So often, getting them into the apartment has to be preceded by shelling out of money, where income assistance shells up money after the people have moved into the apartment. So there's a disconnect between what the landlord needs and what income assistance is going to do. So we've been loaning out and then recouping, or talking landlords into foregoing or delaying. So currently, our St. Margaret's Bay Road tenants are in there, and the landlord won't be paid until the end of the month, as opposed to September 1st because it will take income assistance that long to get a check for the first month's rent, and, and he's willing to wait. So you have to negotiate your way through all of this. 
Um, and that's why funding is important, not so much because we spend a ton, but we sometimes have to front money on behalf of our tenants. Um, who, yeah. who solves that problem with the, with the landlord? Me, or Matt, or one of our board members, or two or more of us. We'll go and we'll sit down and we'll negotiate. And you would be shocked. I mean, there are landlords out there who say, I will never rent to someone with a mental illness, so don't even start talking. It's not happening. And I say, I wouldn't waste my breath. I wouldn't want one of our residents to be in your building. It wouldn't be safe for them to do that. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. It's not you saying, I'm not accepting your clients. I'm saying, I'm not accepting you as a landlord. You're ignorant. Why would I want people living in a building of yours? So some people are just closed. The mind is closed, locked, the keys thrown away. I'm not spending time with them. But you will find a remarkable number of landlords who are, they don't know how to help, but they want to help. They know the housing situation for uh, people that are marginalized is terrible. And they would love to do something constructive about it without putting their own business at risk. This is the answer for them. And they're very, very easy to negotiate with, I've found. Intelligent people, caring people, open-minded. I just, you know, if I were to bring the three individuals, one from um, Urchin Properties, one from Paramount, and one from Salha Brothers, if I brought them in, you would be astonished at their generosity and their open-mindedness. Um, so as long as somebody's out there saying, let me tell you how this works, let me how, tell you how I can protect your bottom line, let me tell you how much good you can do in the world, they're, they're a how can I help, what can I do? How can I make this easier? And I haven't even scratched the surface. I haven't touched Kellum. They're supposed to be, you know, the, um, kind of the saving grace to the homeless. But um, I haven't even gotten there. I'm not sure I want to be involved with such a large mm -hmm. landlord. I want a, a more personal relationship with people that help run my organization. So we may have to go to Kellum at some point. I hope that we get so big that we want to involve every understanding landlord in the community. But address the um, funding challenge because clearly the support person presently the, the OT is a real linchpin in, in helping yeah. everything go yeah. smoothly. Now so, I will tell you we've had tenants for a year without a single cent of funding we have three tenants in the Oxford apartment without a, without a um, you know a paid employee to do the house meetings and goal setting and all of that kind of stuff. Just people with you know with intelligence and care doing this work so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be funded. But if you want more than one apartment, um, you know, I work full time. Uh, a lot of members of our board work full time. Um, it's hard to make time for this if you're already working full time. And I want a professional who has a lot of expertise behind them. Um, but so what? What I did was I actually met with Joanne Bernard personally. I managed to find somebody knew her personally and so through connections I got a meeting in front of her and I told her what our challenges were doing all of this without funding and just with the help of volunteers and so she granted me from her office a one time only $25,000 grant so that we could pay our employee for 15 hours a week and rent a very tiny 200 square foot window was office where we could introduce families and privacy and run photocopies and keep files and that kind of thing. And she said, your job will be to find the staple funding. And I said, oh, that's going to be easy, Joanne. <laughs> Only kidding. Um, but thank you for the break. Thank you for the opportunity to expand a little bit and go out and take the time to find funding. Right now, I'm waiting to hear the outcome of the $75,000 grant application so that we can extend to Matt a full-time contract expand the number of apartments there for. Um, so it can be done on a very tiny microscopic level without funding, but with funding, we can start to fill a huge, huge need in, in the HRN and across the province for appropriate housing for adults who have been given a tough enough hand mm -hmm. to begin with without, you know, without the lack of support in the community. So I, I'm optimistic. I mean, they were supposed to let us know in the middle of June, and then they were supposed to 
video coming in both July and then maybe a couple of weeks ago. And so we're in the middle of that. So we're almost in the middle of September. And Minister Prime says to me, Megan, we're doing the best we can. We've got all the recommendations in front of the minister. We can still need to get a signature. I don't know what we're going to do. We had to cut to Grant Snyder loose for the moment and um, continue to seek out other sources of funding. And here we are. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, it, it strikes me that all of your uh, tenants are male. They are at the moment. I see. Yeah. Uh, we actually have um, a woman who has applied. Yes. Um, this is approved by her psychiatrist, and so she's applied and she's in the process right now. Now, whether she's willing to share in a co ed apartment or not, because they do operate a few of those in Montreal. And they have many more all male apartments in Montreal. They've got a total of 10. Seven of them are all male, one is co ed, and two are all female. And I think in part it's to do with incidence and degree of impairment from the disease. Um, so at the moment, it just seems to be that there's way more demand from families of young men and daughters. But absolutely, we would love to open an all female apartment or a co ed apartment. Down the line, we really would. All we need is three, three gals that want to get together. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, the people are starting to discover us. We've had, we've, we've placed one person referred to us from the Beacon program in Kentville. I don't know if you know the Beacon program. Underutilized. It's a six bed unit. When we met with the first referral that they gave us, two of the beds were empty. I mean, six beds, and, for the, and he's from Cape Breton, this young man that left the program after six months and came to us. But why are there any empty beds? Since the landing, we've had a referral from um, only one of the three um, bungalows is available to people recovering from major mental illness. A $10 million investment in helping people reintegrate into the community, and two thirds of it is shut down, and there's talk of turning it into. Uh, Addictions Recovery Center and starting a mental health program. So a lot of the beds in the 10 bed unit that's left open are empty. It gets wrong, but that's what's happening right now. So people are starting to get to know us though. Doctors are phoning us, psychiatrists are phoning us, social workers are phoning us, people in the are phoning us. It takes a while before they can really trust that you know we're actually offering a reliable, common sense, practical solution to the dilemma of one mom has contacted us recently quite distressed because the placement for her son right now is being brought to an end. They feel they can't do any more for her son. And if he can't move back in with her, they will go back into the shelter. Now, this is not the future for her. It's just not. So, yeah, one of our um, residents, we. Um, recently delivered to his psychiatrist appointment. He hadn't made one in the previous six to eight months. His mother kept begging him to go, and he wouldn't show, and he wouldn't show, and he wouldn't show. And for whatever reason, his outreach worker at the clinic, even though he visited the clinic routinely for medication and for social affairs, he never went for his doctor's appointment. And so um, a friend of quality jumped in his car and went over and picked him up and delivered him to the psychiatrist time in eight months and his mom met the psychiatrist for the first time and spoke to the psychiatrist for the first time. So I as I said to this woman in charge of recovery and reintegration, if we can do a 24 hour turnaround once we found out he wasn't seeing his psychiatrist, surely employees of Catholic Health can do it, but they're not right now in many cases. So um, maybe we'll be a little nudge you know in the direction of more effective outreach. A lot of the people who work for government organizations have done business in a very certain sort of institutional way, and I don't think that they really grasp the concept of in-community treatment. Um, they don't know how to do business that way. They know people coming into their building. They don't know how to get out of the building into the community. So hopefully we'll provide them with some examples of how to do that. So the, the program you said the the French Leonville. Our son lives in Montreal. Oh yeah. 
yeah. He's been here for eight years. Yeah. And it's a struggle because when he goes through these phases, we have to get so an airplane well and fly to my grandfather. But he, we don't know how to get him help. That's well, I'd be exactly. happy to provide you contact information for the brief of the social worker. They have 10 apartments, as I said, 30 residents. Um, and they have two full-time, oh, sorry, one full-time and two half-time coordinators to manage these 10 apartments. And Cheryl is the senior coordinator. I'll give you her contact information. And you can talk to her more specifically about the detail of your family situation mm -hmm. and ask her I mean, I don't know if your son would be open to shared living. He may or may not be at this point, but maybe a visit to Labrie and maybe meeting some of the residents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did that. I took the train to Montreal, mm -hmm. and I was I spent lots of time with residents and volunteers and board members, and it was I was so impressed with the um, how well everybody was functioning in those apartments, how well they were living in those apartments. And your son might enjoy meeting some of the residents have called the apartments and finding out just how great that situation can be for individuals who don't mind sharing space. He's yeah. extremely social, but now he's yeah. starting to isolate himself. Mm -hmm. He's never done that. Oh, oh boy, that's scary. So yeah. it is scary. That's scary. He's trying well, to get through university. It's good for him. No man. Oh, it's, 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 it's a tough situation. Yeah. Is he still in touch with a physician down there? No, he doesn't even know. When we go up, we have to take them to the hospital. It's so little, Cheryl um, will give you, I'm sure, will listen well and talk to you about some options you might want to consider. Mm -hmm. She's very experienced. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Well, thank, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of colleagues if anybody wants them. And that, uh, that concludes our uh, portion of the, the evening for our guest speaker, Lyndon. Uh, if you have any questions about Caldy in the future, you can just give me an email and I can put you in touch with, uh, with Lyndon. Um, and uh, we're going to have a short break and uh, then we'll return to have a little discussion among ourselves. And uh, uh, any questions online for people? Okay, so we'll close for a while. Thank you. Thank you.